Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to dive deep into one of the most fundamental and powerful concepts in alternating current, or AC, circuit analysis, the phasor representation of alternating quantities. If you've ever looked at AC circuits, you've seen sine waves and cosine waves, and the math can sometimes get a little complicated, especially when you have to add or subtract them. Phasors are a brilliant mathematical tool that allows us to simplify these complex, time-varying quantities into simple, static vectors or arrows that we can work with much more easily. By the end of this, you'll understand exactly what a phasor is, how it relates to a sine wave, and how to use it to understand concepts like phase difference. Let's begin with the first section, phasor representation of alternating quantity. The definition states, phasors are typically represented graphically as arrows in the complex plane, where the length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the phasor and the angle between the arrow and the horizontal axis represents the phase angle. Let's break that down with the diagram shown. Imagine an arrow, or what we call a vector, starting from a central point, the origin. This arrow is our phasor. First, the length of this arrow is important. As the label says, the length represents magnitude. In the context of AC circuits, this magnitude is the peak or maximum value of the quantity we're looking at. For example, if we're talking about a voltage that swings between plus 10 volts and minus 10 volts, the magnitude, or length of our phasor arrow, would represent 10 volts. Next, look at the dotted horizontal line labeled reference axis. This is our starting line, our zero degree point. The angle that our phasor arrow makes with this reference axis is called the phase angle. This angle tells us where the alternating quantity is in its cycle at a specific moment in time, usually at time equals zero. Now, this phasor isn't static. It rotates. The diagram shows an arrow indicating the direction of rotation, which is typically counterclockwise. This rotation represents the progression of the sine wave through time. But how fast does it rotate? That's given by the speed of rotation, which is represented by the Greek letter omega. The formula is omega equals 2 times pi times f, and its units are radians per second. Here, f is the frequency of the AC signal in hertz. So, the speed at which our phasor arrow spins around is directly determined by the frequency of the AC voltage or current it represents. So, to summarize this first part, a phasor is a rotating arrow. Its length is the peak value of the AC signal, its angle is the phase, and it rotates at a speed determined by the signal's frequency. Now, let's connect this rotating arrow directly to the sine wave we are all familiar with. The next figure is titled Relation Between Alternating Quantity and Phasor and this is a crucial concept to grasp. On the left side of the diagram, you see a circle with a rotating arrow inside. This is our phasor. Let's assume it represents a current, so its length is I sub m, which stands for the maximum current. As this arrow rotates counterclockwise, its tip traces out the circle. We can see various angles marked on the circle, 0, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, and so on. These are angles in radians. On the right side, we have a standard graph of a sine wave. The horizontal axis represents the angle, theta, in radians, and the vertical axis represents the instantaneous value of the current. Here is the magic, the sine wave on the right is generated by tracking the vertical height of the tip of the rotating phasor on the left. Let's trace it. When the phasor is at an angle of zero, pointing straight to the right, its vertical height is zero. And if you look at the sine wave graph, at an angle of zero, the wave's value is also zero. Now, let the phasor rotate counterclockwise to an angle of pi over 4, which is 45 degrees. At this position, the vertical height of the phasor's tip is given by trigonometry. It's the length of the phasor, I sub m, times the sine of the angle, pi over 4. The sine of pi over 4 is about 0.707. So the height is 0.707 times I sub m. Now look at the sine wave graph. At the point pi over 4 on the horizontal axis, the value of the wave is exactly 0.707 times I sub m. Let's continue. When the phasor rotates to pi over 2, or 90 degrees, it's pointing straight up. Its vertical height is at its maximum, equal to its full length, I sub m. On the sine wave graph, at pi over 2, the wave reaches its positive peak, with a value of I sub m. 
as it rotates to 3 pi over 4, its vertical height decreases. At pi, or 180 degrees, the phaser points straight to the left. Its vertical height is again zero, and the sine wave crosses the horizontal axis. As it moves into the bottom half of the circle, its vertical height becomes negative. At 3 pi over 2, or 270 degrees, it points straight down. Its height is negative I sub m, and the sine wave hits its negative peak. Finally, as it rotates back to 2 pi, or 360 degrees, it returns to the starting position, its height is zero, and the sine wave has completed one full cycle. So, you can see that a sine wave is simply the unfolding of the vertical projection of a rotating phaser over time or angle. This is the fundamental link between the two representations. Now that we understand what a phaser is, let's use it to understand a key concept in AC circuits, phase difference. This brings us to the section on leading and lagging phase difference. In many AC circuits, the voltage and current waves don't peak at the same time. One can be ahead of the other, which we call leading, or behind the other, which we call lagging. First, let's look at the concept of leading phase difference. The diagram shows two sine waves on a graph, labeled VA and VB. Notice that the wave VB reaches its peak and crosses the zero axis before the wave VA does. The horizontal distance between the corresponding points on these two waves is the phase difference, represented by the Greek letter phi. Because VB happens earlier in time, we say that VB leads VA. Mathematically, if VA is described by the equation VA equals VM times the sine of theta, then VB would be described as VB equals VM times the sine of theta plus phi. That plus phi is the mathematical way of saying it's shifted to the left, or ahead in phase. Now, look at the phaser diagram on the right. It's much simpler. We draw the phaser for VA along the horizontal reference axis. Since VB leads VA by an angle of phi, we draw the phaser for VB at an angle of phi, counterclockwise from VA, remember, counterclockwise is the leading direction. So the phaser diagram clearly and simply shows that VB leads VA by phi radians. Next, let's look at the concept of lagging phase difference. This is the opposite scenario. In the waveform diagram, you can see that the wave VB now reaches its peak after the wave VA. It is lagging behind. The phase difference is again the angle phi. The equations reflect this. If VA is VM times the sine of theta, then VB is VM times the sine of theta minus phi. The minus phi signifies a shift to the right, or a delay in phase. The phaser diagram again makes this very clear. The phaser for VA is on the reference axis. Since VB lags VA, we draw its phaser at an angle of phi, but this time in the clockwise direction from VA clockwise is the lagging direction. The diagram simply states, VB lags VA by phi radians. So, leading is a positive phase angle, represented by a counterclockwise rotation on the phaser diagram. Lagging is a negative phase angle, represented by a clockwise rotation. Let's look at a few specific cases of phase difference. First, we see a graph of a cosine wave and a sine wave. The text says, they follow each other by exactly pi slash 2 radians, 90 degrees, apart. If you look closely, the cosine wave is at its peak when the sine wave is at zero and rising. The cosine wave is essentially a sine wave that has been shifted to the left by 90 degrees. Therefore, we can say that the cosine function leads the sine function by 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. Next, we have a figure showing voltages in phase. In the waveform diagram, the two voltages, VA and VB, are perfectly aligned. They reach their peaks at the same time, cross zero at the same time, and reach their minimums at the same time. The phase difference, phi, is equal to zero. In the corresponding phaser diagram, the two phasers for VA and VB would be pointing in the exact same direction, lying on top of each other. Finally, we have a figure showing voltages out of phase. This is a special case where the phase difference is 180 degrees, or pi radians. In the waveform diagram, when VA is at its positive peak, VB is at its negative peak. They are perfect mirror images of each other across the horizontal axis. In the phaser diagram, the phaser for VA would point to the right, and the phaser for VB would point in the exact opposite direction, to the left. The angle between them is 180 degrees.
Now, let's move on to the mathematical representation of a phaser. A phaser is a powerful graphical tool, but its real strength in circuit analysis comes from its mathematical representation as a complex number. A phaser can be represented in two main ways, rectangular form and polar form. The time domain representation of a sinusoidal voltage is given by the equation V of t equals Vm times the sine of omega t plus phi. This describes the voltage at any instant in time t. Phasers allow us to convert this time-dependent function into a static number. A phaser is a complex number that represents the amplitude in phase of a sinusoid. Let's start with the rectangular form. A complex number, which we'll call z, is written as z equals x plus j times y. Here, x is the real part of the number, and y is the imaginary part. The letter j is the imaginary unit, which is the square root of negative 1. In mathematics, you often see this written as i, but in electrical engineering, we use j to avoid confusion with the symbol for current. The rectangular form is very useful when you need to add or subtract phasers. You simply add the real parts together and add the imaginary parts together. Now for the polar form. The same complex number z can be written as z equals r at an angle of phi. Here, r is the magnitude of the complex number, which corresponds to the length of our phaser arrow. And phi is the phase of z, which is the angle the arrow makes with the positive real axis. The polar form is extremely convenient for multiplication and division. To multiply two phasers, you multiply their magnitudes and add their angles. To divide, you divide the magnitudes and subtract the angles. There is also an exponential form, shown as z equals or times e to the power of j phi. This is mathematically equivalent to the polar form and is derived from Euler's formula. The diagram of a complex number shows this relationship graphically. We have a horizontal real axis and a vertical imaginary axis. Our phaser, z, is an arrow from the origin to a point in this plane. The horizontal distance to that point is x, the real part. The vertical distance is y, the imaginary part. The length of the arrow is r, the magnitude. And the angle it makes with the real axis is phi. So how do we convert between these two forms? The formulas are provided. To go from polar form, r and phi, to rectangular form, x and y, we use basic trigonometry. The real part, x, is equal to or times the cosine of phi. The imaginary part, y, is equal to or times the sine of phi. To go from rectangular form, x and y, to polar form, r and phi, we use the Pythagorean theorem for the magnitude. The magnitude, r, is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. The angle, phi, is found using the inverse tangent of y divided by x. So, the complex number z can be written in all these equivalent ways, z equals x plus jy, which is the same as or at an angle of phi, which is also the same as or times the quantity of cosine phi plus j times sine phi. Let's look at the final phasor diagram to put it all together. This diagram shows two phasors on the complex plane, one for voltage V and one for current I. The voltage phasor, V, has a magnitude of Vm and makes a positive angle phi with the real axis. So, in polar form, we write V equals Vm at an angle of phi. This means the voltage is leading the reference by an angle phi. The current phasor, I, has a magnitude of Im and makes a negative angle, negative theta, with the real axis. So, in polar form, we write I equals I am at an angle of negative theta. This means the current is lagging the reference by an angle theta. The curved arrows show the leading direction is counterclockwise and the lagging direction is clockwise, reinforcing what we learned earlier. This brings us to the final, and perhaps most important, summary box. It shows the direct equivalence between the two worlds of circuit analysis. On the left, we have the time domain representation. V of t equals Vm times the cosine of omega t plus phi. This is a function of time. On the right, we have the phasor domain representation, V equals Vm at an angle of phi. This is a single, constant complex number. This is the power of phasors. We have transformed a complicated, time-varying sinusoidal function into a simple pair of numbers, a magnitude and an angle. This makes solving complex AC circuits, which would involve a lot of difficult trigonometry and calculus in the time domain, as simple as basic algebra with complex numbers in the phasor domain.
In conclusion, we've learned that a phasor is a rotating vector that provides a simple way to represent a sinusoidal quantity. Its length represents the peak amplitude, and its angle represents the phase. We saw how the vertical projection of this rotating phasor traces out a sine wave, creating a direct link between the two concepts. We use phasors to easily visualize and understand leading and lagging phase differences. And finally, we explored the mathematical representation of phasors as complex numbers in both rectangular and polar forms, which is the key to simplifying AC circuit analysis. Understanding phasors is a gateway to mastering AC circuits. Thank you for watching.